hopefully you're on your lunch break and you're going to join me for cleaning a tenderloin, which I know we've done before, but I always feel it bears repeating. Uh, I'm relatively new to uh, monetized YouTube, over 1,100 subscribers, lots of support these days. Really appreciate it. when you watch, when you click the thumbs up, and when you subscribe. It means the world to me. What are we doing today? We're sharing some knowledge from the kitchen. Uh, first off, what do you guys think of my new wall here? I've uh, added some background noise here to make sure that um, my videos are you know, always trying to elevate. I've got a lot, of, lot in the works, a lot in the works. So uh, I'm gonna clean a tenderloin and then we're gonna sous vide. I got a new sous vide machine, which is good and bad. Um, I had to buy a new sous vide machine because my last one, well, it crapped the bed. Um, these have come down in price. Uh, this is a VP Cock Sous V. Am I saying that right? I don't know. Model 805A. Um, I really like the kitchen gizmos. That's what I've been using for the last mm, five, six years. But, um, you know, they only last about two and a half, three years. What happens is the impeller stops spinning. And then it doesn't hold even heat. And I usually discover that when I'm at an event and my sous vide isn't cooked through and through. So we're going to unbox that. We're going to vacuum pack this. And we're going to clean the whole kick and boodle. As always, any kitchen questions, throw them in up in the chat. Um, if I happen to miss your chat for any reason, I apologize. Still new to YouTube Live. And I will add a, a link or a, answer your question um, once I get into, um, once I go back and look at the uh, questions. Okay, well, as always, pull the chain off, okay? Pull the chain. I like doing sous vide for cooking classes because um, I can do that now. I'm gonna sous vide for two and a half, three hours. And then I just take it in the crowd back, in the, in the chef mobile, and I'm gonna make a cut here. I'm off to the cooking class, and then uh, I will just put a, you know, throw in the broiler, you know, kind of sear it. I might bring the sous vide pump with me to show people what the heck it is, but I don't, you know, necessarily need to uh, dwell on it too much. So much of a cooking class isn't necessarily, hey, we've got to be super hands-on, and then I get rid of the feathery fat, it's low, what I call low-hanging fruit fat, which, <laughs> if you read some of my... YouTube comments from other butchering videos. Somebody thinks that's the dumbest thing they've ever heard. Um, but, I don't know. I think it's funny, so that's all that really matters. It can make yourself laugh, right? So, get rid of the easy stuff first. Maybe that sounds like obvious advice. We'll come back to this chain here in just a minute. How did I learn to butcher? Well, I was as a young culinarian, and this is true of most young culinarians I find, you don't get to cut meat, you don't get to butcher because it's expensive when you make a mistake. You know, if I cut through this, now we've lost, you know, a lot of uh, usable product, and you make enough mistakes and you could erase the profit uh, for the day in a restaurant, so. It's something that it's hard to get your hands on uh, as a young culinarian. So what I did was when I took over my first restaurant and started running my own kitchen, I would order in whole cuts of meat and cut them myself. I would practice with the house's money uh, and learn my way through this. It started with whole cuts of meat like roasted strip loins, roasted tenderloins, things like that. Just learning how to clean them up, just honing my skill. Um, I have some colleagues who are professional butchers and they you really have to pursue it. I mean, you really, you're probably going to have to work in a commercial setting. Um, here in Denver, we have companies like Lombardi Meat. They do, you know, kind of high-end butchery for a lot of the great restaurants. When I worked in restaurants, I would order from them pretty frequently. I had a couple of couple of sources of meats. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket as a chef when you're purchasing. So these guys, these are just attachments. This is, I know there's a little tiny bit of meat there, but trust me, it's not worth 
chasing down that little tiny bit. Um, maybe, 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 maybe you could turn that into like steak tartare or something, or add it to like a burger grind. Like this fat here will grind for burger, burger grind, because it's soft, and that little bit right there. But see, there's a little itsy bitsy tiny bit of silver skin right there, and that will grind, that will jam up the grinder. So, you know, I guess it just depends on your threshold. Uh, the thing is, tenderloin, uh, beef tenderloin doesn't make a very good burger. It doesn't have enough fat content. I uh, remember a chef that I had in culinary school worked in the Middle East for uh, the royal family there, and forgive me my ignorance for not knowing, I believe it was Saudi Arabia, Arabia, and he worked for a prince, or something like that, and he was a chef at this is a long time ago, so I don't remember all the details. But he had an unlimited budget, basically, and he would bring in tenderloins and try to make burger patties out of them. And he said, hmm, not as good as just using, you know, top round, bottom round, truck, to add a lot of fat to it to make it flavorful enough. But that was an interesting story. I don't know why I remember that so, so well. Okay. So, silver skin. Look at this guy, this one. Jamming along on this one. It's great. Okay, this is the bull. This is a separate muscle. I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Okay. I just run my fingers over. I don't know if you saw that, but when I like this, like a big thing, uh, like this, all of that, we want all that off. This is looking good. Okay, this big knobby fat that doesn't have any connective tissue running through it, you can leave that on. That will render. This stuff, you gotta pull off. This silver skin, Look at this. Tug, tug, tug. Look at that. Ugh. So hard to, to chew through. Conversely, I worked with a chef. I use that word, that term loosely when I was in Medina, Ohio. And I was opening up a country club in the kind of our sister restaurant, the chef there. He would just go whack, whack. He would tip, tip, literally pull it out of the cryovac chain and all and go whack 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 and you'd be cut these big you know 10 ounce tenderloins and like, what are you doing dude you know like you're not even removing any of the any of the silver skin or the chain or anything that's the way our customers like it so i didn't believe them but one day i was there out in the dining room i was doing some work i was writing some recipes it was kind of quiet. A couple, like four motorcycles pull up, big Harleys, and they get off and they sit down for lunch. They were kind of doing a cruise, and it looks like night friends having a nice afternoon. And they ordered four of the tenderloin special, the ten ounce tenderloin special. And sure enough, they just ate around the fat and left the. But they were very, very satisfied. They felt like they got a really good price for the. Why get a six ounce center cut when you get a ten ounce special cut for the same price? And I was like, okay, that's actually kind of clever marketing because a six ounce filet is this big and then you add four ounces of garbage to it and you serve it at the same price, it's the same size cut. <laughs> and they, people feel like they're getting more because it's bigger. Uh, it worked for his clientele. I, I was, I was flabbergasted. I was, flabbergasted. That, I was not impressed with his, with his uh, mastery of the kitchen, but uh, maybe with clever marketing. Maybe I really chalked that up to more of a clientele who just didn't know, didn't know any better. Let's just say it was a rural area in Colorado with uh, not a very sophisticated uh, clientele. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, back to my tenderloin here. Yeah. You know, I've never found a great. I've never actually learned the right way to do to separate these two muscles. So what I'm talking about here is there's what's known as the bull which is this muscle here, and then this is the main tenderloin. And let me make sure. I'm trying to get all the silver skin off before I make this last cut, just so there's no surprises when I'm done. Anyway, back to learning how to butcher. Um, I have a colleague, a friend of mine, who's um, like professional level, high-end, whole hog butchery. I mean, he really, really knows his stuff. Uh, very good cook. And... Um, you know, but so he had to go work in like commercial places, like a like a, uh, a high end meat market. That
that sells commercially to get enough reps down to learn what the heck you're doing. Because you might cut the same same steak for months before they move you on to something else. All right, so typically there's a natural seam um, between these two muscles. And there's not really, I've never found a good place to cut. So unfortunately I end up doing what I call an educated guess here. Um, I feel like I want this to come all the way to a point here. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna cut. And I know I screwed that up because see how the grain changes from there to there? That's not correct. But when it's cooked and carved, no one has ever said to me, hey chef, you cut that in the wrong direction, you see? So I go based more on ultimate yield. Okay. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off this end about that much. I'm gonna cut off this end about that much. I'm gonna come back to that. This is gonna get crowd back. We'll do that here in a minute. The chain, what I do is there is a nice other half of the bull nose is back here. Okay. This guy is not the most pleasant cut of meat because there is some sinew and stuff running through it. But I know how to make money off this cut. It's funny, when I do videos, you know, I don't cook commercially anymore. I cook commercially. Hmm. Never really thought of it that way before this moment, but that is true. I am cooking commercially. I don't really cook commercially anymore. Okay, this, all of this, every bit of this, I would be handed when I was a young culinarian, be told, take all the meat off, and you have to sit there and scrape and kill, you know, maybe tartare, things like that, um, you know, add to the burger grind. It was busy work. And because you're like, chef, I want to butcher something. Great, clean this up. Um, you know what I do with these now? Throw them out. Uh, might, might add them to a stock pot. Okay, so there's this here. A couple different things you can do with this guy. I believe this has a name. I'm sure it does. Everything at Alpha Cow has a name, a Latin name, a known name. You know, like a Kansas City is a strip steak with a bone in, and then a Kansas, uh, New York strip is a bone out, Kansas City, and then a strip loin is the whole thing, and then a bone in strip. I mean, they all have, you know, it's amazing how many names they give each cut. So this guy, um, you know, this could be a lunch tenderloin. You grill this whole, this whole, and this gets sliced and gets in and added to your steak salad. It gets diced for stroganoff. Um, then these guys here, I don't uh, waste that in the in the old days. What I would do is I would cut off uh, about a four ounce chunk on each end, maybe maybe about that big. I would sandwich them together and then put two pieces. Pardon me, two three ounce pieces, which is a little bit bigger than this and then sandwich them together and then put two one ounce pieces of bacon with a big toothpick. That would get grilled. That would be a bacon wrap twin filet. So it'd be a single, you'd look like a single muscle. And that was my, that was my discount steak. Um, it was very popular. So I would take all the scrap. Um, gosh, I'm always talking about ways I'm ripping people off in the restaurant business, but that is, that is indeed the, uh, the goal of a chef is to get as much good money for the scrap as you do for the premium stuff. So a center cut would be, you know, one, two, three, four center cut fillets, and then you would have some medallions, and then you can make some twins. And the medallions, the, the, the medallions don't sell as well. That you pound flat and you do, you know, like maybe like if you're table side or something like that, you can do stuff there. So all of this I will save for another application, and then we're gonna cry back. Nonetheless, I digress. Um, but getting as much good money as you can for for quote unquote bad product is the job of a professional chef. And with bacon wrap twin fillets, let's say, and then gosh, it's been forever since I wrote a menu where I actually had to write it to make a, a profit. Um, the later years of my restaurant days, I would work uh, banquet cooking, but and I would be a, a manager to some degree, but I wouldn't necessarily be in charge of the kitchen. There was a lot of pressure off of me uh, to, to kind of take a little bit of a step back from being the executive chef and just kind of be a, be a cook. Uh, off 
to my second job. Huh? And someone joining me, welcome to our live feed. I uh, just uh, cleaned tenderloin. I'm about to show some best practices on sous vide. I'm about to unbox my new sous vide device. Who doesn't like new stuff, right? Right, right, right. Okay. Gonna switch here. Uh, this always happens. I've got this big long foot prep table and it never feels like enough space. All right, here we go. Anyways, um, so, but okay, so back when I was cooking for money and having to write the menu and justify my food cost, uh, I would, let's say, serve a 28 ounce center cut fillet, pardon me, a six ounce center cut fillet for, let's say, $28. I'm sure the price is more now. But I would do a bacon wrap twin for $26, and it would also be eight ounces. So a lot of people would take the cheaper, or $25, 25 or $26. So a lot of people would buy the cheaper steak. Um, and then if I had to 86 it or cancel it because we sold out, no big deal. We have the other, I could, yeah, sure, I'll tell you what, I'll throw some bacon around that center cut filet. We won't upcharge you. No problem. <laughs> um, all right, here's our sous vide uh, device. And <laughs> back to that in just a moment. Uh, so actually the lesser expensive, because again, Memphis is not a very sophisticated dining region, uh, the less expensive items uh, would be uh, more popular. So I could be a little less precise when I'm cutting it if I ended up with more um, three and four ounce chunks, no big deal. No big deal. And then whatever our dice would go into steak salad or beef stroganoff, which were both staples on a good menu because they use up a lot of cheap scrap product or expensive scrap product. All right, here we go. The VP Cock Sue V machine. Owner's manual, you know what we do with those. Pitch them, never read it. Never, never read. Okay. Oh. Oh, I wish that didn't happen. Let's see. Uh, did I break it? No, not quite. Okay. So compared to my old kitchen gizmo, which I was pretty fond of, with the exception of they seem to break down every two years. That's good. That's for easy cleaning. But honestly, I find myself never using that. Full of plastic. Zip tie cord seems to be high quality. They need to be because you know this is a submerged in water, so you have a higher standard of things like cords than if it wasn't submerged in water. It's funny, I always describe these as it's like a hair dryer that goes in water. And uh people don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, this is flimsy, this is not good. Look at this. So there's no clamp. There's no the the other one that I had, the kitchen gets I had a clamp that you would squeeze. So but I got I got a workaround for that. Okay, and then when I plug it in, these typically don't work right when they're not submerged. Plug in. Oh, okay, I got it on and off. Let me uh, get a pot of water going here. We'll submerge it and I'll show you what's happening here. So, oh, I got it. Almost forgot everyone. Okay. We're almost missing critical stuff. Food saver. Come back to this. Food saver. So I've got a couple different food savers, and honestly, this is the least expensive model. Uh, recently, I saw these at the grocery store, uh, King Supers, the, the nicer ones, the grocery store that, um, you know, they've got like full deli, a little bit of a kitchen section, uh, 79 bucks, less than that, and it came with plenty of bags. Don't, sh don't try to ch be too chintzy on these bags. Leave, if, whatever you think, add an extra inch or two. Cut. Roll this back in. I have one that was like an automatic feed. Didn't work very well. Boom. Seal. And why that sealing? You need to dry in. So I pulled the back, bag back on itself. That's the keys in the kingdom right there for packaging this. Seal. Okay, good. If I'm doing something wet, like I'm putting soup in one of these, I'll double seal it. 
Not that they do a very good job of sealing though. Okay, and there we go. I try to keep this as straight as possible. I don't make a U, because once it cooks in that manner via CV, you can't undo it. I might do a snake, but if I cut this long enough, which it looks like I did, straight to that. Okay. And obviously I'm on a little overboard here. So what I'm gonna do is actually I'm gonna I'm gonna sacrifice an inch or two to the CV gods by cutting it off. But trust me, you're better off wasting two or three inches than cutting it a millimeter short and having to do an entire another bag. Uh, ask me how I know. When I first got these, you know, I used the commercial ones in kitchens all the time. They all just use the same pre-made bag. Back and seal. What I like to do as it's backing and sealing is try to chase down any areas that the air might not be perfectly evacuated. Like right here, kind of. The better the seal, the better it cooks. Yeah, I still got some air in there. It's not a very powerful pump, so you got to help it. It's both vacuuming and sealing the bag simultaneously. It's interesting when the vacuum achieves, you can actually see the moisture left over start to boil, which is true of liquid in a vacuum. This side, I do like this double uh, seal. I take up any slack, as much slack as I can, and I seal again. That helps make a better uh, a better uh, seal in the sous vide keeps, keeps it from wanting to pop open, which it can because it's only being held by its own um, vacuum. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Ooh, that, <laughs> that edge is hot. Seal. Try to get the vacuum back to be kind of as tight as possible. Gosh, it's almost one o'clock already. Hmm. <sighs> I had a big event yesterday and they ate me out of the house and home. So I have to get to the grocery store and then down to Parker, which is from Denver. You know, unless you live there, it's in the middle of nowhere. I lived there for 10 years, so. Uh, I mean, it's a lovely community, so don't get me wrong, but. Uh, you know, as an adult with no children, I was, I don't know why I live there. I'm glad I don't anymore. Let me just say that. Okay. That looks good. I'm happy with that. Let us get this into the sous vide, test out the sous vide, and then that will be the end of our live. Of course, I will post this up so you can watch it any time. That water you hear behind me is me filling up my sous vide vessel. I have a very special TV vessel. We'll see you.
big old pot of water. In you go. Hot or cold water? Hot water is best. Help your machine along. Okay. Let's see here. I'm right at the minimum line. And instead of using more water to help hold that down, I'll take a pot. I'll just pop that in there to take up some of the volume and to help hold the food underwater. So I've got another pot in there. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, Celsius. No. Ew. Not Celsius. Never. Celsius. Yuck. English. Okay. Sous vide. That pump works great. I'll show you here in a minute because as we're finishing up, this thing is circulating water like a champ. It's whisper quiet as well. I'm actually so far extraordinarily impressed with this product. Um, okay, after setting, oh, okay, there we go, press the set time, press to adjust the time, the default cooking two hours, 55 years, if you need to change, press and hold the temperature icon for five seconds, yes, okay, that was easy, okay, I'm gonna, so the default looks like it's, 97.1 degrees, which seems like an arbitrary number to me, but I'm sure in Celsius it makes sense. The, the real question is, will this hold its temperature uh, once I set it and unplug it, plug it and unplug it? Oh, there it goes. Oh, I see. Okay, that was current temperature. Oh, this is better. Okay. I'm gonna go, this is a new device, so I'm gonna go one, I'm gonna go 127. And I'm gonna go, it's default for two hours. I used the default mine for eight hours, so I would never forget that it was running. So here we go. I'll put it up to five hours. Okay. Now let me unplug it and see if these settings help. So that was one of the things I very much liked about my old device. One thirty-one. Okay, so that doesn't hold, but one thirty-one isn't a bad place to start. That's probably smart for people who might overcook stuff. And then, oh yeah, and then the default's two hours. So unfortunately, it recessed to that. But uh, this is easier to use than the uh, kitchen gizmo. Uh, and the reason for that is Kitchen Gizmo had a wheel that you had to toggle and it was really incredibly finely indented. So it was very, very, very easy to uh, go too far in one direction or the other uh, when using that device. So uh, honestly, so far, uh, the VP Cook Sous V Model 805 Alpha. Um, initial impression, fantastic. I'm really uh, impressed with it, with the exception of the clamp. But I have a solution for that, and I'm going to show that to you right now. All right. Plastic wrap. Oop. It lights up nice, too. I don't mind that. I don't mind it being lit up telling me, hey, dude, you're operating. Okay. That will help hold that in place. A little belt strap right there. I am going to add a little bit more water because I do not want to risk it evaporating below that line. Which is here in Colorado, I don't want to risk it evaporating below that line because here in Colorado, oh yeah, it only took maybe an extra two quarts of water, a quart of water or so to bring that up to a reasonable level. Um, this evaporates faster than you think, and uh, here in Colorado, um, uh, it, it happens really fast, and then you end up, the machine turns off, and your stuff doesn't cook. And finally, just a thin layer of plastic wrap over the water here, 
will help it get to temperature faster. Right now it's at 100 degrees. That right there creates a little bit of a thermal barrier. Yeah, my pump was not working on my old one for a long time. I can tell, I can tell now, now that I have a new one, it's kind of like when you get new sunglasses or new reading glasses or a new windshield in your car and you don't realize how bad it was until you get a new one. So that's definitely the uh, case here because, um, I mean, I guess you feel the pot rattling uh, a little bit, which is good. I mean, that's an indication that it's got a good, strong pump. So, you have 101. Uh, the, I will say the kitchen gets about heated up extremely fast, but maybe that was its downfall was at it, but, um, at the expense of longevity. So we'll see how this one holds up. Anyways, all right, everyone, if you join me, appreciate it. If you, if you uh, threw anything in the chat and I missed it, I'll get back to it. Uh, thanks for joining me for Friday afternoon. Cooking class prep with Chef Mark. You know, dude, if you're watching this, click, click that thumbs up button. Why don't you think about subscribing? I think I got a lot of great stuff on this channel that could help you in the kitchen. And I got a lot of great stuff planned, so I'm looking forward to seeing you back here. Come back anytime. Take care. Bye-bye.